Welcome to part two of these shows about microfossils. This one is about single-celled organisms called Foraminifera. Foraminifera is Latin for whole bearers. A vast amount of knowledge concerning these unicellular entities has accumulated over the past two centuries. Indeed, so much that a summary of just the main points requires two shows. This first one gives a current view of the placement of foraminifera in the scheme of life and discusses the criteria used for their classification as it is generally accepted today. The jelly-like protoplasm of these single-celled amoeba-like entities is enclosed in a shell called a test. So named because as shown on these slides, the test may be completely enclosed by protoplasm extruded through one or several small openings in the test called apertures. These fine strands, philopodia, form a mesh, a reticulopod, to capture food. In sea floor dwelling forms, other coarser projections of plasm called pseudopodia permit locomotion and aid in orientation of the test. On the right side of this slide is a new version of the position of foraminifera in the ladder of light. In the last decade, multigene and protein coding analyses have greatly advanced the elucidation of relationships between the enormous variety of protists, the old sarcodyne pigeonhole for foraminifera and the relatives is discarded. Most of them are now listed as alveolata because of their possession of coarsely packed sacs, alveoli, under their cell membrane. On this uh, University of California Museum of Paleontology wheel, they are one of a number of life forms assigned the protists, almost all of them microfossils. Although classed as microfossils, the tests of many foraminifera exceed a girth of one millimeter, and a number of multi-chambered forms attain five millimeters. Some coiled ones are more than 20 millimeters in diameter, and some simple tube-like fossil forms reach a length of nearly 150 millimeters, six inches. But the most numerous species, living or fossil, would fit into the eye of a needle. This key slide shows that the routinely accepted classification of foraminifera does not involve DNA or other genetic data. It is based on criteria observed by a conventional light microscope or viewed in scanning electron images of plated specimens. Sixteen groups of growth forms are recognized, each an order of the class Foraminifera. Among the 16 orders, there are at least 164 families and more than 47,000 species. But this is a conservative estimate because Foraminifera have diversified into every possible marine habitat and a few forms prosper in fresh water and soil. Consequently, test construction, feeding mechanisms, reproductive strategies, and commensal and symbiotic relationships are extremely varied, but the composition of the test wall is confined to three main categories. Organic walls, called proteinaceous or tectinous, are polysaccharide coatings on a protein. But glutinated, the organic or calcite wall includes extraneous grains, commonly sand, either randomly chosen or selected on the basis of size, shape, specific gravity or availability, and secreted walls constructed exclusively of crystals of calcium carbonate or silica. Calcium carbonate walls are subdivided into three groups according to the arrangement of the crystals of limestone. The textures produced are microgranular, porcelainous, or hyaline. These next slides repeat 
the criteria for classification of foraminifera by the composition of test wall and the number and disposition of chambers, but they add some information about preferred habitats and stratigraphic ranges. Note the limited range of the fusilinids. All ranges mentioned are correct, but they are not noted on some slides. And the nimulites, another family of large foraminifera, are restricted to the Paleogene, the earlier stages of the Cenozoic era. The next step in the classification of foraminifera requires study of the chambers, their number, dimensions, and the procedure used to add them to the test, their pattern of development, their structure. This chart lists the names assigned many of the patterns, but the slides show only a few of the simple arrangements of chambers, mainly of sea floor dwelling form. Some patterns, the structures comprising the test, are much more complex than those pictured. Here are photos and sketches of a few of these complex forms in which the chambers are subdivided and the connections between them range widely in relative size and intricacy. The kind of aperture and its location are critical to the identification of a foraminifer's genus and species. These slides show the more common types of apertures, many of which, as this slide suggests, are associated with but one kind of wall and but with few test patterns. The names used to describe apertures are listed on this chart. They indicate its shape, its location, or both. You have now been told about three of the four basic criteria that together identify the order, family, genus, and species of foraminifera. They are composition of the test wall, along with the orientation and precise composition of secreted crystals, the test pattern as it develops during the growth of the individual involving the number and shape of successive chambers, that is the structure of the test, and the type and location of the aperture or apertures. Sometimes ornamentation, too, is involved in species recognition. The fourth factor to be considered in the classification of foreman affairs is their habitat. As mentioned, all but a small group of foreman affairs are marine. Although as shown on this slide, large numbers live in brackish and hypersaline environments. Those that live in or on or immediately above the sea floor are benthonic, a part of the benthos. Benthonic foraminifera that live buried in the mud that form under marine waters are referred to as infauna. Other types of bottom dwelling foraminifera fix themselves on the mud floor or use pseudopods to cruise over it in search of prey. These are called epifauna. Here, seven living genera are pictured. Another large group of foraminifera are set apart because their habitat requires them to adopt a limited number of patterns of secreted tests. They are plankton. They live in the euphotic zone of the sea, the depths to which sunlight penetrates, about 200 meters, 650 feet below the surface. The foraminifera that live in this environment are planktonic, free-floating. But most can control the depths to which they sink. Only a few weakly trochoid genera spend part of their existence more than 100 meters down. They are part of the reign of tests of dead foraminifera that over much of the deeper ocean covers the seafloor with Globigerina ooze. But below about 5,000 meters, 16,500 feet, calcium carbonate is completely dissolved at the carbonate compensation depth on this slide labeled CCD. So only benthonic agglutinates are found below it. The second row emphasizes the diversity of foraminifera. These differences make them useful in the search for petroleum. They also provide data on ancient bathymetries, water temperatures, climates, and paleogeographies. 
Routinely, they perform tasks seemingly impossible for a brainless blob of protoplasm.